The Greens have been running candidates in Ontario elections since 1985. They are still waiting to elect their first MPP. Still, they are running a full slate of candidates like the three other mainline parties. And so let's put that platform under the microscope. Joining us now for their views, Marcel Weider, longtime Liberal and President at the Aurora Strategy Group. Peter Sherman, formerly the progressive conservative finance critic and member for Thornhill. Marit Stiles, federal and provincial NDP strategist. Eric Jacoby Hawkins, former Green Party candidate and the co-chair of that party's federal shadow cabinet. And Robert Benzi, Queen's Park bureau chief at the Toronto Star. And it's good to have everybody around our table here at TVO. Mark, first time for you here. Yes. Thanks for coming. Let's just start with this. I think Mike Schreiner has taken pains to show that today's Green Party is not your grandfather's Green Party. It's about more than just the environment. Yes, Peter, how successful has he been at doing that? I take them seriously. How successful? As in, will they elect any members in the election that's underway now? The answer is, I don't believe so. Um, I think it probably would be a good thing if we had a Green or two Greens in that legislature because I think that there are elements of the platform that we're going to discuss that are worthy of discussion and worthy of incorporation. But I don't think um, they're ready for prime time, and I think it's going to be another election before we see a Green in that legislature. Marcel. Well, I think the fact that Elizabeth May got elected federally is a sign that the Greens are being taken seriously. But in Ontario, I think they still have a way to go in terms of reaching out and connecting with a lot of voters. Now, if Mike is able to get elected in Guelph, that would certainly put them on the map and they'd uh, stand a better chance overall. Mara. Well, I, I don't really disagree at all of those points. I mean, at the end of the day, it's about the Greens electing an MPP in this election, and until they can, they're not really going to be the kind of force, and they're not going to get the attention or, frankly, the media attention that they're going to need to get their message across. Uh, their platform document is very interesting. It's obviously an attempt to reframe the, the image of the Green Party, and I think they are succeeding in doing that to some extent, but I think for most Ontarians, green still means environment, although if you go through this document, you've got to flip through a good number of pages before you see the word environment anywhere. Which I did mention to Mike Schreiner, and you've yeah. noticed that too, I'm sure, Rob. How different is this Green Party from your grandfather's? Well, it's different, but I, I don't know if it's going to be any more successful, unfortunately. I mean, Mr. Schreiner is, a, is an effective leader in the sense that he is uh, accessible, good on, good on camera, good uh, in, with the newspapers. Uh, they've got some interesting ideas. But in poll after poll that I've seen, they're not much above the 3% that they got in the 2011 election. Their high water mark was 2007. I think it were 8 9% that year, 7 8%, 8% a year yeah. because of the, uh, the faith-based schools issue. So they've got a tough slog ahead of them. The first-past-the-post system really penalizes smaller parties like the Greens. Since it's been raised, you did run hard, Eric. The Green Party did run hard in 2007 on one unified school system. In other words, defunding the separate school system. You're running hard on that again this time. It played pretty well for you in 2007. What are your hopes this time? Uh, I think it's uh, an issue that a lot of Ontarians connect with. And for whatever reasons, none of the other parties want to touch it. And although uh, the Green Party puts it forward and it does generate some, some opposition because it's a, a, a privilege that's been there for a century and a half. Mm -hmm. And so it's very entrenched. Um, but I think there is still a huge a groundswell of people who understand that there's a, an anachronism here, that we are funding a specific religion only and not the other ones. And it made sense in the 19th century, but in the 21st century, it's time to look at that again. And I think that they respect that we're willing to look at that, even if they don't agree with the conclusion it might come to. Peter, you know I want to get you on this because, of course, in 2007, the Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario ran on extending funds to other faiths it was a solution that the public of the day didn't like, and obviously the PC party kind of went down in flames on that issue. But that's a dangerous mix, right? Religion, education, and politics. Do you think the Greens are smart to wade in on it? I think the Greens are differentiating themselves in a positive way, and I think it is an issue whose time will come. Um, I am arguably the only person who got elected on the faith-based funding issue in 2007. The issue of whether Peter Sherman was a good MPP, I think, was resolved somewhat in 2011 when I widened the lead and there was no faith-based funding issue. Having said that, um, there are times, and thank God nobody who was my opponent ever found them out, when as a talk radio host prior to 2007, I said, why the hell is Ontario the only place left in North America that doesn't have a single public school 
school system and nobody ever unearthed the tapes. The bottom line is I could live with funding other religious education. I still think it's a reasonable issue, but it's not one any party's going to fight. And if that's not the case, then why are we funding Catholics? So I think the Greens are on the track. I think that the only reason that it hasn't come to the fore in this or other election campaigns to date is because parties are very wary of it, all parties. They think that it's going to kill them. I'm not sure that's true, but I think the Greens, um, to differentiate themselves from other parties, have taken a particular tack that uh, at a given point, given that we're talking about a bill and a half, maybe two billion dollars of savings in a time where we need it, are correct to be t uh, promulgating that idea. Marcel Weider is shaking his head. I assume you don't think those savings are there to be had? No, I don't think those savings are to be had. You know, the Catholic school system has to, like the public school system, follow the same curriculum established by the Ministry of Education. Uh, the savings in terms of the Catholic component is a very, very minor part because it only represents a minor part in terms of the overall school day and the overall instruction. So where are people are getting this billion and a half to two billion, I'm not quite sure where it is. Well, they say duplicate administration, duplicate transportation, et cetera, duplicate maintenance. But what, we're see but what we're seeing is that in a number of school systems where the Catholic and the public are starting to share the same facilities, we know that on some of the... Uh, purchasing, that they're doing that cooperatively. So we're seeing some of those uh, efficiencies being realized. Now, to extend it, absolutely, it's worth looking at. But in terms of uh, you know, merging the two systems, I'm not sure if they're there yet. We can argue the theory of what it's worth, and I'm not going to get into that argument because Marcel may be right, and I may be right, and the Greens may be right. Who knows until you do it. Here's what I can guarantee you, that you've got a Catholic province, and it is 90% Catholic, called Quebec, that undertook this as a cost-saving measure about 15 years ago. They didn't fight an election over it. Nobody lost their seat over it. The Catholic uh, masses who wanted their kids educated were told, well, you know what, send your kids to after-school classes or send them to Sunday school and things will be fine. And you know what? The election went on as usual, the same party was re-elected, and that was it. Here, it's fear that motivates us not to confront religion and education in the same box. Robert, do you think this issue, I mean, the whole campaign so far has been about jobs and the economy, pretty much. Can they get some traction on this issue, which for, you know, a, cer a certain segment of the, of the population is a popular idea? It's, it's the Greens' best issue. The public is way out ahead, uh, as, as Peter says, on this issue. Um, the NDP won't touch it because the Ontario English Catholic Teachers Association is a big backer of the NDP. The Liberals won't touch it because they don't want to be messing up, mess, messing with something. The Tories won't touch it because of what happened in 2007. So they have a nice clean uh, uh, kill for the for the uh, uh, the Greens, so, so to speak. I also think that. It, it, it's, it's kind of interesting. We're, we have in Tim Hudak, the first Catholic leader of the progressive conservatives, I think maybe ever, and certainly in modern times. Mm -hmm. So if anyone could do the Nixon to China on the issue, probably Mr. Hudak, who was a product of Catholic schools, uh, could have done that. They've chosen not to do it. It seems to me very odd when you're talking about finding efficiencies, finding ways to streamline government and, and save money, that this is the one thing you wouldn't look at. Mara, can I get you on this only insofar as I've talked to numerous New Democrats over the years who find who find it odd that the New Democratic Party, which is, you know, it's, it's the least religious of all the parties, if I can put it that way, would still be standing up for publicly funding one particular religion over others in this day and age. Do you find that odd? Uh, I, I think this is really a timing issue. I mean, at, ultimately, you know, is Ontario ready to have this debate? And I, I do think it's a useful debate to have. And I, and I do, I, I think the Green Party raising it, it's an important issue that we have to confront here in this province. The party has debated this issue. Uh, it is complex. It's an issue that some people care very deeply, passionately about. Mm -hmm. But there are a pretty small percentage still of the population that has those strong feelings about this particular issue. At the same time, we're confronting very real immediate questions about how our education system is being funded currently and, and some very specific issues. A hundred and, what, 24 schools are set to be closed under the Liberal government's plans. Uh, another 174 are, are potentially on the chopping block. We absolutely do have to find ways to fund these schools. Um, we need to make these schools more of the, a hub within our communities. Uh, is it the right time to be talking about this? Look, I'm from Newfoundland. I grew up with, uh, I think, seven school boards, OK? We did away with that. But we did away with it because there was a very important opportunity, an opening of the debate, unfortunately, because of the sexual abuse that went on in some of the schools uh, and in the church. And, and so it was an opportunity, right, to have that conversation. 
and the, the whole community was involved. Um, and I think that's the kind of conversation that's going to have to take place in this province before you do away with it. You know, I guess, Dalton McGinty, I'll get, get to you in one second. Dalton McGinty uh, was our second Catholic premier mm -hmm. in 150 years, basically. Mm -hmm. He didn't do it. No. He could have been the Nixon who went to China, right. chose not to do it. You know why? That's a question you'll have to ask him on the air when he comes by. <laughs> because, <laughs> because his mother wouldn't let him kill the Lord's yes. Prayer in the legislature. Yeah. He figured he better go nowhere near the schools. Okay, maybe. You wanted to say, Eric. I just want to mention that I'm, I'm living this issue myself because my wife teaches in the public board and the default would have been to enroll our children in the public school system, but they wanted to bust them halfway across town. And we had a perfectly good elementary school three blocks away. Wh which town? They can is in Barrie. In Barrie, okay. And so because my wife is from Catholic background, we were able to enroll them in the Catholic school. So they walk every day, which is very important to me as part of living in a city, is walking to school. Mm -hmm. And it's a wonderful school. And the, the Green Party plan wouldn't defund that school. It would maintain that school. And it would what it would do is take away the barrier that says, uh, some of the neighborhood kids have to be bused to another school and they can't walk to the nearby school. It would can maintain the school and the teachers and the classrooms. It would just get away from this idea that we have to bus you past a school that's the wrong religion or wrong system to get to a further away school. Well, Mike Schreiner didn't say it in our interview today, but I have heard him, Marcel, say it in the past, mm -hmm. that he thinks it's passing strange to be publicly supporting, with our tax dollars, a school system where the current Premier of Ontario would not be permitted to be a teacher because she is an out-of-the-closet lesbian. Uh, I leave that out there for people's uh, consideration, but does that not seem strange to you? It's uh, an issue that in today's uh, modern society we all have to uh, deal with, and uh, I'm sure that uh, that's something that you know, the Catholic School Board will uh, address in due process. Moving right along. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what the heck he said, but I'm moving right along. Let's talk taxes. All of the parties have different ideas out there in order to create jobs. And we've seen the list. The tax credits of the NDP, the job subsidies of the Liberals, uh, the Conservatives are talking about cutting corporate income tax rates, uh, the Greens are talking about the payroll tax cut. You're a former finance critic, so I'd like to get you on this. There are four eminently debatable ideas. Who's got the best one? Well, uh, first of all, I, I think we can talk about who has the best one. Let me deal with the Greens first, since that's the prime subject. I took a look at the payroll tax cut, and uh, we actually just debated a bill before I left in December that had to do with an increase of the exemption from 400 to 450. And, and the sum total of doing that, and this debate went on for weeks, was that uh, at, the, at best, a business would save $850 per year. That's not going to close or open any business. So if you doubled the exemption, which is what the Greens are talking about, from 450 to 900, the, the calculation at 3% is a business would save 12,000 if they qualified for the absolute maximum. $12,000 is not enough to hire one more person. In this climate, it's not enough to hire one half more person at minimum wage. That being the case, I don't think you're going to create an awful lot of jobs. Kind of like the NDP saying, we're going to create jobs by giving you a 10% deduction to a maximum of $50,000, which means we'll give you a $5,000 tax credit for creation of a job. And, and I can tell you as a former businessman of many years that if somebody says, if I, if I create a $50,000 job, I'm getting 5,000 bucks back for two years, that's not going to be my incentive to create a job. That's going to be a handy dandy little collection of $10,000 for me if I create two jobs. So it's a Full stop, period. So, so I, th I think if you look at who's going to create jobs, I think it's an arguable uh, debate between liberals who say uh, by infrastructure investments we will be able to stimulate uh, the public economy and create jobs there, or Tim Hudak, who, who says on behalf of the PCs, we're going to lower tax to the lowest jurisdiction in, in uh, North America. We are going to cut taxes at the individual level to put more money in the economy. There will be jobs as followed from that. And it's for the electors to, to uh, decide. But the bottom line is it's, it's not the Greens' plan that's going to create jobs. Mart, he's sort of in the midst of that answer, taking a poke at the seriousness of the tax credit the NDP are offering in order to create jobs. Is he right to take a poke I, at that? You know, I think what's important is that what the NDP is saying ultimately is that we've given conservative and liberal governments have given uh, corporations a hell of a break in Ontario for many years to the point where we have some of the lowest corporate income tax rates in the region, including the states around the Great Lakes. And Ultimately, what we've seen happen is you give them this great deal, 
and then they pack up and they leave and they take those jobs with them. Are you going to attach any conditions? Are we going to reward job creators of this province? Or are we just going to hand them all of these tax cuts? So a payroll tax break might actually do the job then? I don't think it's necessarily a bad idea. I think the problem is that it's only one little tiny piece slice of the pie. And I think it's an important one. I mean, I have to say, you know, supporting small business has been a big focus for the NDP in this election. And actually, I mean, people talk about it like it's something new, but I've been involved with the NDP for years and years, and it's certainly been high in our priority list to respect and, and, and nurture small businesses. But uh, I think at the end of the day, we need a bigger, more comprehensive plan in terms of how we're going to create those jobs, and we have to stop rewarding companies that are going to pack up and take those jobs out of Ontario. Let me ask you, Marcel, in this regard, you run a small business. I do. It's, maybe it's a little bigger than smaller, but I don't know. <laughs> but would you not like the idea of not paying employer health tax on the first $900,000 of payroll instead of $450,000 of payroll? Look, it certainly is tempting. But what we need is a good plan, a large, you know, overall view of how we should be tackling this in the economy. And that includes things like investing in infrastructure, making sure we have a proper health care system and a uh, well-funded education system to create the people that are going to be able to take the jobs in the future. Our competition is not going to be against Tennessee or Mississippi, as Tim Hudak wants us to be. Our competition is going to be against Europe and other uh, high-educated uh, jurisdictions. Okay, but, that's the, but the payroll tax. The payroll tax cut the Greens are offering as an idea. Good idea? You know, it has merit as far as ideas are concerned, and that's what elections are about, is discussing ideas. And so we should have a debate on that. But I think at the, at the end of the day, you need an overall arching policy, and that's just one small component of it. Robert, how do you see it? Well, Steve, Ontario has a $12.5 billion deficit. So look, the, the Treasury desperately needs revenue. So I don't know what, what kind of hit this, this, uh, this payroll uh, cut. Well, would, they say none. Take. They say it would be... Always revenue neutral. Well, <laughs> These things they, are always revenue neutral. They say neutral. they'd raise taxes on so-called Bay Street corporations to raise the money that they would give away for the... Uh, for the payroll tax cut. It's, well, I mean, this is the thing. Everyone's going to raise money on somebody else and not, and not on, on, on this group or that group. And, and then at, at some point, though, uh, it, it's going to affect the bottom line at the Treasury. So does it, does it affect the bottom line because the Bay Street Corporation decides that it's going to decamp to Calgary because it's not competitive to stay in Toronto anymore? Or, you know, so it's... Eric, are you concerned that by giving small businesses a break, you may actually be punishing big businesses to the point where they may leave? Uh, I'm not concerned about that, no. I think Should that... you be? <laughs> I think the big corporations have a lot of considerations about where they locate, and I think that uh, we're already at one of the lowest corporate tax rates, so that's, we're doing as well as we can for that anyway, and I think we have a bit of fiddle room to stay at one of the lowest jurisdictions. Um, and I have to agree that the payroll tax cut outlined in the first point is a small piece. I think it's really in the right direction that if we're going to create jobs with tax cuts, the best way is to cut the taxes on jobs instead of general tax cuts on whether it's a sales tax or a corporate tax or an income tax and hope that that magically translates into jobs because a lot of that money doesn't. Um, so it's the right direction, but I think it ignores that throughout the platform there are other job creation measures. There's $3 billion in annual transit infrastructure investment beyond what's currently being invested. Mm -hmm. There's a billion dollars a year uh, in investment in retrofits, and those are real jobs in our communities. You can't offshore... Uh, improving the energy efficiency of your home and your business. So when you put these all together, and a lot of those uh, infrastructure investments go towards the small companies that would also benefit from this payroll tax cut. So you have to look at the platform as an entire job creating platform okay. rather than just that you're, one point. You're talking about $3 billion a year to help create more transit infrastructure. Yeah. The Liberal Party is talking about $2 billion plus a year mm -hmm. for public transit infrastructure and so on. Yours is more, I have to say, the Green Party is clearer about what that would cost people. Yep. You've put it at the bottom of your press release. This is right 250 there. bucks a year on average per family. Mm -hmm. You haven't been as clear. Do they get credit for that? I think, you know, that uh, the budget spelled out clearly the transit uh, investments that uh, the government was prepared to do. And, and that's something that, unfortunately, the NDP couldn't support is improving our transit. You know, the, the uh, Conservatives at least are quite clear in that they opposed it. Now, if we're to address the issues, you know, this was a budget that was going to do that. You know, 
This is one of the most interesting questions, and, and I'm a guy who has sat seven years in that legislature, and I am also a guy who was responsible for urban for a period of time as well as transit. So if we're looking for three billion, two and a half, three billion a year to invest in transit, and we are and we must, I don't understand at this point how the Greens are going to get it, other than they're going to put their hand in my pocket and, and I don't have any more money to well, give. Congestion charges they talk about? Well, they talk about it, but, but people have roundly rejected all of these things. So my former leader, Mr. Hudak, says, well, we can do it on savings and we don't have to take any money from you. So that's magic money and, and I wish Tim luck if he becomes the Premier in doing it, but I don't understand it. Uh, and, and I look at the Liberals and the Liberals, number one, are not fully funded in their platform and number two, they don't say in any specific specific terms where that money is coming from. So it, it all comes down to one thing, other than the Greens, repurposing. And repurposing means shell game. We're going to move the money around and we're going to find a way to do it. So I wish everybody good luck, but meantime, we're sitting here having this conversation and Toronto's not getting a downtown well, relief line. Let's, for example, say, Mara, to you on this one. In London, England, they have had for a long time congestion charges. You want to drive your car into downtown in rush hour, you're going to have to pay extra for it. What's been the result? Um, they have more money to spend on transit, and uh, I think from all accounts, it's been a pretty positive thing. People don't like paying more, obviously, but uh, the congestion in downtown isn't as awful as it used to be. The Greens have been bold enough to put that in their platform. Should it be in other people's platforms? I think it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult question for a lot of Ontarians right now who are feeling the pinch, right? I mean, we, and this has been a theme for Andrew Horvath and the NDP, uh, you can make all the promises you want to make. The Liberals made 70 promises in their budget, their platform that was written by Ontario civil servants. Um, and they, they 70 promises, uh, they can't really say how they're going to pay for it. Um, Ontarians are wondering, do they trust the Liberal government after they've put us into this terrible financial situation by paying for these gas plants uh, to buy the last election? And at the end of the day, you know, are we, who is going to pay that? Like, are Ontarians actually willing to pay more for this, to invest in this kind of service? I mean, I do believe there are Ontarians who want to be able to invest in, in infrastructure development. The NDP has made the downtown relief line a priority, as well as the electrification of the line to Pearson, um, which which is a big issue in, in my riding in downtown West End Toronto. Uh, but I do think it's a tough issue right now for many Ontarians who are really having a problem with how unaffordable um, life is. Their paychecks have remained the same while other costs have continued to increase. Do the Greens get credit for being as specific as they have been in how to deal with this transit infrastructure? I, they do, Steve, but you know what? When you're not going to win outright, and when you're, and Mr. Shriner's quite, uh, quite honest that he's, it's a boutique strategy looking to win one seat, maybe two. When you're doing that, you don't have to be as, you can be more truthful, I guess. You don't have to be as <laughs> all encompassing as, I mean, Kathleen Wynne came, became Premier, you know, last year and talked a lot about, you know, revenue tools for transit. And, and we, we, we were expecting to see tolls and things like this. She lost her nerve because she faced political reality, I guess. And maybe if she wins a majority, she might resurrect some of the things that she talked about when she was still thinking that she do could do Do you want to it. respond to the comment from the Toronto Star over here that the Premier lost her nerve and that's why the revenue tools have melted away? No, I, I think, you know, that uh, she didn't uh, see uh, that the uh, NDP or the Conservatives were prepared to support uh, bold uh, policies and, uh, you know, that gave her a moment to pause on this issue. Peter? Robert touches on an overarching aspect of, of what we're talking about, the Green Party. The Green Party at this point, and I cast no aspersions. I mean, I, I, I admire the, taking up the challenge of hitting the hard issues on the one hand. On the other hand, here's what they know, and here's what we know, and here's what your viewers know. The Green Party is not in any number going to put people into that legislature this time around. In fact, I would w wager that they're not going to put anybody in there. So they are in a position to be much bolder than parties that are manipulated manipulating political footballs, trying to get themselves elected. I'm not saying that parties, any parties lie. I don't believe they do. I think parties set out their best, their best efforts to achieve the things that they say they're going to achieve. And the reason that people out there say, well, all politicians lie is because nobody ever gets the whole thing done in four years. That's the bottom line. So it's easy for the Greens. It's not so easy for the guys who are actually going to win this election, which is one of two parties. You'll ignore, well, we shouldn't say. <laughs> my view, my okay. view, my okay. view. Okay. Poll out today said 33-33-28. That's still a pretty close fight. Wait till tomorrow, though. Wait, well, till, wait till tomorrow, tomorrow. Yeah. okay. <laughs> Eric, uh, 
the, the, the allegation, or I should say, the, the, the issue has been raised that you can promise all the whatever you want, and you can be as clean and say you guys are not going to be corruptible like all the rest of them, but you've never had to actually had the rubber hit the road, so it's easy for you to do it. Fair? Uh, well, I'm glad to hear that it's, it's easy to be green. <laughs> that <laughs> hasn't been my experience. But I think actually when, in the future, as the Green Party moves from having a few seats to being a, you know, a caucus and then an opposition, and when the day comes that the Green Party is poised to sweep government in a future election, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised to see that the honesty that we bring at this stage is going to still be with us, and that's because we attract a different kind of candidate. We don't draw in people who are seeking power and a payback because we don't have a payback to offer. We draw people who see problems in the community that aren't being dealt with in the status quo, and they say, let's come in with something that resonates with myself and my community that I can be honest saying, and I can put myself out there as a volunteer okay. and do this. So I think we, we do draw that. Now, as far as feeling the pinch, and, and we do, um, I, I live in Barrie, and the pinch we feel is a time pinch, the huge amount of time people spend trapped in traffic mm -hmm. and commuting. And if you ask any of those commuters who are spending often two or three hours a day or more commuting, and you say, would your family be willing to spend less than a dollar a day more in congestion charges or fuel taxes or parking to get you home 20 minutes sooner every day? I think that's where Ontarians are saying, and the, their reluctance is to have a general tax increase. See the HST go up, or the income tax go up, or, or any of those, because they don't know where that money's going. But when you have a tax that, say, you're paying more for this congestion, and that money's going directly into relieving the congestion. And you well, can the Liberals, see the of course, say they're doing that. Between that. The Liberals say they will do that. Well, we need more of that. I'd like to see that happening and that people can trust it. I guess people don't trust the Liberals to do it that way. Okay. And that's well, your candidate in London it. trusts us because he left you and uh, <laughs> endorsed us. Oh, he didn't endorse anyone. <laughs> no. You should just explain that for a second. The, the guy who was running for the Greens in what riding? Was it London, London West? London yeah. West decided to back out of the campaign right. and he said Premier Wynne's doing well enough and therefore, I'm not sure, he was a, <laughs> it wasn't a full-throated endorsement, but, but there you go. Just so we explain the message is clear. Uh, but seven minutes to go here, gang. Let me yeah. put uh, at least one more issue on the table here, and this comes up, it seems, every election campaign. Uh, the Greens are not in the leaders' debate. Uh, at the moment, they're not even in the Northern leaders' debate. Robert, what do you think of that? Well, they don't have a seat, and I don't. I don't. Ha I, I, I mean, I sympathize with Mike Schreiner for not being invited, uh, but they don't have a seat, and. If you let the Greens in, then every other you know, small party is going to say, well, wait a minute, we're, field, we're going to field 107 candidates, so why can't Paul McKeever run for the Freedom Party or one of the other, or debate from one of the other smaller parties? I, I get where the Greens are coming from, and, and you know, they are the legitimate fourth party in terms of the polling and, and in, in recent re election results, but until they have a seat, I'm not really sure they should be at that debate. Mara, how about it? I, I I agree. I think it's probably the criteria by which we have to decide who's in the debate. However, I, I do think it's unfortunate, and I know that you know in the past NDP leaders like Jack Layton have advocated to have Green Party representation in the debates, and I think it would be really interesting to have that voice in that debate. Absolutely. Um, real question though is why aren't we having more debates? Uh, really, you know, Andrea early on uh, okay, and the NDP challenged for more debates. Why aren't we having more? It's a different question for a different program. The question on this <laughs> pro <laughs> question on this Try program though. is yeah. The question on this program. Is, are the Greens entitled to be at that table? Marcel? Well, I happen to agree with uh, Rob. Uh, until they actually have a seat in the legislature, you know, uh, it opens it up to too many other uh, groups. But I, I think that uh, what we're seeing is, is that they're able to you know, help to define the election and put out the issues there. Uh, that's the key to uh, a healthy democracy. And if they're able to do that, and they'll be able to do it with their election advertising, with their, uh, with their candidates across the province, who, by the way, in most uh, communities are invited to uh, debate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're able to get their message and their platform across. I think that's healthy for the system. Peter? If I were a Green Party organizer, I'd go in the direction they're going, but I'd go heavier. That is, take the strongest candidate I can find and put that candidate in the most winnable writing possible and make the priority taking the money that they raise and, and underpinning that campaign and getting somebody into the legislature. If that person is in the legislature, Robert Benzie is 100% correct. There's a total legitimacy about asking for a place at the debating table. Right now, unfortunately, there's not. Eric? Well, I, having a seat or not isn't actually the rule. And if that were a rule, then we could more confidently aim at meeting that 
hurdle. But there are no official rules. That's just put forward as a, as a pretext or an excuse. Uh, so what I would like to see is a set of rules. And the rule could be that or it could be something else. It doesn't have to be either a seat or no rules. And anybody can come in and be a part of the debate. You could have, and the, the other thing with a seat is it's backward looking. It's looking at who did well in a previous election. Right now, no parties have seats. Well, let's the put the it this way. The legislature's dissolved. So, Robert, if you had a, if yeah. there's 107 ridings. If you ran a candidate in every riding, is that a threshold high enough to participate in the leaders' debate? Because I think there's only four parties who do that. Well, I think the Greens would argue that it is, uh, but I'm not. Again, th remember there is there is no law around. around Eric's mm -hmm. right. There's no law around around the debates. It's a broadcast consortium comes together. They invite you to to, to moderate. Thank God for that, because at least we <laughs> know that the show will go on. Um, but. Uh, there, there is no set. It's nothing set in stone. Mm -hmm. So the Tories and the, and the Liberals and the New Democrats, they can say privately, no, we don't want the Greens in there. It's not doesn't help us. If you're a New Democrat, do you necessarily want another party nipping at your heels, another progressive party nipping at your heels? No, not. And the same with the Liberals and the Tories, for that matter, they don't want to take up any use up any oxygen on another party. So. In the last federal election, the only riding to get more than 75 percent turnout, it says here, was Saanich Gulf Islands. Mm -hmm. Guess who won that seat? Yeah. Elizabeth, Elizabeth May. May. Yeah. Same thing happened in Andrew Weaver's writing. He became the first Green representative in the British Columbia legislature. And that's the mobilization that I was talking yeah. about. They mm -hmm. took the strongest force that they had. They put money behind it. They put a campaign behind it. They got a seat in the legislature. And, and uh, in the process, she wound up at the debating table because she made enough noise. Schreiner's got to go there if that's what he wants to do. Totally we presume agree. because those debates haven't happened yet. The, the debate in the next federal election, we assume Elizabeth May will be in it, but there are no rules, so it hasn't been confirmed. And the next mm -hmm. uh, leaders' debate in British Columbia, again, we assume the Green Party will be in, but we haven't had that debate yet. So even now, we have to, as Greens, mobilize resources to try and ensure that that actually plays. It'll too. be very difficult for them to exclude Elizabeth at this at this point. Well, she's not an official party in Parliament. True. And there you go. But still, she... She's got one, two she, seats. Yeah. Got two <laughs> seats. Um, a bit of a mischievous question here, but here we go anyway. <laughs> it's not in the Liberal Party's interest to have Mike Schreiner at that debate, right? Because a lot of the territory that you guys, the, a lot of the voters you got, your party and the Green Party both go after, is the same voter. And they lost, I think, 5% of their votes in the last election. And they lost them, I think it's fair to say, to the Liberals, because the Liberals had not a bad record on the environment last time, shutting down the coal plants and so on. So it's not in your interest to have Mike Schreiner in the debate, is it? Uh, I can tell you that our policies have uh, reflected a very positive attitude towards the environment, that uh, the Green Energy Act, that uh, closing, as you pointed out, the coal plants. So, you know, a lot of uh, what uh, the Green Party is putting out, you know, we're already doing. That's my point. Green Energy Act is a disaster. <laughs> no, no, and I think even no, the Liberal Party will admit that. My, that wasn't my point. My point is you're appealing to the same electorate, and therefore it's in your interest not to have them at the table. <laughs> no, that's the first time I've ever had anybody look at me and go. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, <laughs> who's going to give me odds here that the Greens can actually win a seat this time? Eric, do you think it's out there to be had? I'm not a gambler, but I know they're working really hard in Guelph, and they're making appeals across the province, and pulling everything we can into that riding, so it's certainly going to make a best effort, and if it doesn't happen this time, the lessons learned from that campaign will, I think, guarantee it happens next time. Robert, I asked uh, Mike Schreiner this question. I want to ask you, too, because you're there every day and you see it. Would one Green MPP really make a difference down there? I think it would. I really do. I, I think it would, it would give the party a legitimacy in the legislature that uh, makes all of us in the media take them more seriously and also send a signal to your activists around the province that, yeah, we can get a toehold in here so that now we have one and then we have two. That's why they pushed so, so, so hard for the referendum in 2007 for a mixed member proportional representation because they, they knew that was their best shot at actually having uh, seats. You've sat in that legislature. Would one Green MPP make a difference? Yeah, it would. Um, I, I don't hold out a lot of hope, although I wish Mike Schreiner well. But I can tell you that a motivated and articulate MPP in the legislature representing mm -hmm. even just himself and a party, uh, you know, for future possibilities, would get the Robert Benzies of the world and the Globe and Mails of the world and, and even the Steve Pagans of the world asking him <laughs> questions on a regular basis about his policies, and he'd be 
less constrained than the mainstream parties to answer the questions in a more forthright way. It's only when you get bigger and have a chance at forming government that you go, whoa, <laughs> this, is, this is an issue I've got to skate around. Mara, would it be worth having a Green MPP in the legislature? Absolutely. And, uh, but I think the real problem is, can they get elected in this election? And I have to say right now, I think that their strategy, to Peter's point, uh, is failing them, right? They need to focus on it. I'm a longtime party organizer. It, it, it makes me sad to see the fact that the Greens can't focus their energies on one riding and win it. And I think it makes all the difference in the world. There are so many voters out there who are looking for other alternatives. That's why there's so much pr support for proportional representation. Last 20 to Marcel. I'll remind people that uh, federally, the Conservatives were down to two seats, Jean Charest, Elsie Wayne. And they still were able to generate a lot of interest and a lot of attention. So, you know, size does not necessarily matter. It's the quality of the people that count. And if you have the right uh, MPP, as uh, Peter pointed out, that can help. Good enough. Good to have everybody around the table for the discussion. Our, what day are we on here, Benzie? Day 175. Of the <laughs> <laughs> I think it's 20, 25, 25 to, go? to go. Something like that. 25 to go. to go. Anyway, appreciate your time, everybody. Thanks for coming into TVO tonight. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.